Health and Fitness, Tuesday, February 8th on KPFA FM 94.1. This one's for all of you. And you're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 6.30. Stay tuned next for Pushing Limits. Welcome to Pushing Limits, KPFA's program from a disability rights perspective. We're dedicating our program tonight to Carla Toth, who died tragically last Tuesday. Carla was a well-educated environmentalist and outdoors woman who worked at many Bay Area nonprofits. We send our sympathy to her friends and family. A historic moment occurred in 1988 when students at Gallaudet University, the National School for Deaf People, hired Dr. I. King Jordan as its first deaf president. The school's board of trustees had originally chosen a non-deaf person instead of Dr. Jordan. Both were considered accomplished administrators. Students at the university protested, demanding that Dr. Jordan be hired, and eventually the board accepted to their demands. In the U.S., this is one of the first instances when a group of persons with some form of disability created a nationally recognized movement that resulted in an example of self-determination. Today, we're here to discuss the role of able-bodied people in disability organizations. Is it useful or good for able-bodied people to be recognized as leaders in our movement? I'm Doyle Saylor, here with Eddie E. Tuarte. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Doyle. And Ruth Ann Schapinner. Hi, Ruth Ann. Hi, Doyle. Hi, Eddie. Hey, Ruth Ann. You're at home, right? Yep. Yep. Our special guest tonight is Patrick Connolly. Patrick is a longtime disability activist. He was a former member of the board at both the Marin Center for Independent Living and Protection and Advocacy, a statewide organization which does legal and advocacy work on behalf of the disability community. Welcome to Pushing Limits, Patrick. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So tonight we have a delicate question, a troublesome question, but a badly needed question. Eddie, is it your opinion that uh, is it important for disability-oriented organizations like the independent living centers to be run by people with disabilities? Specifically, should the staff with most responsibility, like executive directors, be people with disabilities, and why? Oh, I think it's real vital that at this point... um your, your your managers, your boards, be people with disabilities. Um, I think that people that do, who don't have disabilities have an have an able-bodied way of approaching work. I think they have the instincts, um, and the the um, the the worldview of not having a disability. And I think, like in other kinds of movements and other kinds of um, communities um, where you have a woman's com- uh, in the w- women's movement, I think organizations um, should be headed up by women. Um, same for the lesbian community, same as a, a Latino or, or African American community. Um, if you have programs serving these populations, um, I think they uh, should be staffed and managed by uh, people from those populations. And that's you know the way I see it. Well, we'd like our listeners tonight to call and give in your opinion later in the broadcast, and you can call us at 848-4425 after we have a discussion here with Patrick. Uh, Well, Ed Roberts, uh, who I was closely associated with for 20 years, the father of independent living, was really a strong advocate that management should be people with disabilities. Um, Non-disabled people are very vital to, to the movement. I mean, but at some point, if they get it, they'll know to get out of the way. (laughs) Um, it's, uh, I mean, Ed, Ed was an example too. I mean, when he, uh, started the, helped start the CILs, I mean, there were were an incredible number of people that did it. It was a community effort. 
And um, I think that was the part of the, the most important thing was having people with disabilities there. I mean, those folks at the beginning inspired people to hitchhike across the country in electric wheelchairs, I mean, in the 70s, because here was an opportunity to get out of the, the stereotype and, and to be able to do things. And, I mean, everybody with a visible disability that manifests itself, the people say, you have a disability, um, you know, understand the glass ceiling and, and understand how even in disability programs were not taken seriously. Um, you know, as a person with a head injury, you know, probably one of the most successful people with a significant head injury, um, you know, my opinion isn't counted in the head injury community because uh, I'm obviously too high functioning. You know, I mean, I've I spent an incredible amount of energy to be mediocre, and, and it's not even appreciated. Um, I, I think, you know, that the people, you know, independent living centers, I mean, one of the things was they received this management experience to break through the glass ceiling and to carry out a philosophy. And, and, and unfortunately, it didn't, didn't manifest that itself. We have a disability rights movement instead of an independent living movement now. Uh, I think and that's the community shifted its focus to something that was different because um, you have this group that, that brand identified itself as disability rights, yet, um, you know, really has to hold punches back. Um, and I think, you know, that's why there's so many small grassroots groups. Um, like Dries, you know, which I'm president of, and, and other groups all across this, uh, the state that are, that are forming because people want to be in charge of their own lives and destiny. And, uh, if the official taxpayer sponsored groups aren't going to do it, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Patrick, this is Ruthann. Do you think people with disabilities have, in your opinion, have the requisite skills at hand to staff these agencies and better yet head them up? Well, anybody that has to rely on attendance to get them up in the morning uh, probably has a lot of personnel skills that, that go unrecognized. Um, you know, people have incredible, I mean, a person with a significant disability really is a business. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at it that way with income coming in through, you know, most people have benefits and stuff. And I mean, I think that's another thing of not having disabled people in charge. Uh, we never got over, uh, you know, a successful thing being somebody on SSI and having IHSS if you have severe physical disabilities, for example. Um, we never got beyond that to how do we generate wealth and how do we, we keep uh, power, economic power in ourselves. And I think in one way we, we've, we're, we're headed for the war on poverty model rather than the empowerment model that was so successful in the 70s and 80s and I think culminated in getting us the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you'd like to make a call in, uh, I'd like to remind you, you can call at 848-4425 and ask questions of Patrick or and or of Eddie or Ruth Ann. Right. Um, uh, Patrick and Ruth Ann and Doyle, um, I was one of the people that really wanted to have this program and this subject um, air tonight um, and one of the things though I hope I'm not or we wouldn't necessarily be misunderstood is that the, this, the non-disabled community the able-bodied community has given a lot to our community in terms of expertise in terms of support and advocacy and um, you know sometimes these folks are you know directors and these are the people I I I, I would uh, label the technocrats, for lack of a better word. And so um, I hope we're not seen as really being divisive, you know, on, on this on this subject. Um, but I wonder at some point whether it's time for, you know, for the people who head up these groups to um, to make room for people with disabilities. And if somebody wants to answer that question now, then we're going to have a call in from Kathleen from Sonoma. <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, did, did anybody want to talk to that issue about uh, about the technocrats and the and the people who need uh, should they be moving out and and and, and letting um, um, folks with disabilities take over? Um, you know, I, I definitely think people should. I mean, I think one of the things that Ed always stressed was that you know there are a lot of skills that people things that people have, and but they should be training replacements to take their place. Uh, you know, if you're really skilled and have a unique talent. You know, you can go to other nonprofits besides independent living centers after a while. Um, 
you know, what what happened is, you know, and, and it's people with disabilities, too. I mean, because, a lot, you know, in independent living centers, the board of directors has to be a majority of people with disabilities. And in the beginning, instead of using that freedom, they decided, I'm not going to be an advocacy. I'm going to take it, play it safe and be a service agency. And I'm going to be services. The closest service people I can find are from the developmental disability, de- developmental disability system. So a lot of people in top administrators were hired from there. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think you can see, you know, in terms, you know, you can see a different tone of advocacy from independent living centers, and the good ones are usually uh, staffed and managed by people with disabilities. On the other hand, you know, you you have, you know, in California we have the history of Catherine Capisi, who's uh, served Republicans and Democratic governors, and I'm not sure what she's done for people with disabilities. Uh, And she's a person with significant disabilities. Um, The rehab counselor that first turned down Ed Roberts was a person, one of the few rehab counselors in the 70s that had a disability, or the 60s. Um, So, I mean, it it, it just, uh, I think there's, there's more motivation, though, if you're a person with disabilities, to, to try and, and you understand the things that are going on and you're not an obstruction like some people become. Could we have uh, Kathleen from Sonoma? Yes, I would like to say something. Um, I'm wondering how we prevent, um, as has happened in the Northwest, um, how we maintain our constitution in terms of people with disabilities. Um, in California, we have a pretty good constitution, and it's better than the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. But um, anyone with a significant disability in a state such as Oregon, which has, has a basically southern constitution, southern, the people came from the south, and to a lesser degree, Seattle, People up there, you know, if you speak out, they just they just make you disappear. Thank you, Kathleen. You just disappear into the system, you know, the medical system. And we need to be really careful that when we have leaders that are disabled, that people are watching their backs. And uh, I don't think many able-bodied people realize how manipulable... Um, the, the system is, um, and it's true in many, many states, um, not so much in California. I am disabled, and uh, I had, I did 10,000 hours of supervised um, work and was about, well, it was a year or two from getting my MSW, so I'm not, you know, I'm, um, I'm aware of a lot of things. <laughs> um, so, does anybody want to ask a question? Uh, thank you, Kathleen. We're, we're uh, actually uh, focusing on Patrick Connolly tonight. Um, would you care to say something to... Uh, well, there's always safety in numbers, and I think that's, that's one of the things about having leaders that we can identify with is, is building a sense of community. So you have, you know, not only people who are, uh, you know, on their way up and, and just trying to get their bearings, but also people who have been successful and, and can be involved in community activities and interact with people. One of the, the worst things about segregation has been that, you know, we're all stuck with one type of person, you know, without being able to make those contacts. And, I mean, contacts are 60% of generating wealth. Well, let me ask you a question that's related to that, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, dangers for the disabled community is ghettoization. And what I mean by that is that uh, we uh, we uh, need to have jobs in the uh, business world, but uh, the primary way that we're going to be able to get jobs like this is to demand them in in these areas where disabled people have already have a lot of power and rights. And uh, so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that, which is uh, if we if we make these demands felt in one area, how do we break out of that area and get get uh, jobs for everybody elsewhere? Well, I think one thing is we have to, I think, start thinking about generating wealth rather than jobs, and that's probably a whole other program. Um, but I, I think in terms of an advocacy agency, and I think any, every nonprofit that does services with people with disabilities should be doing part of their budget should be advocacy, or else they're really, you know, a failure as a, as a, as a group. But, I mean, at some point you need to, to be able to develop those skills to be able to move out. 
It isn't to say that, you know, disabled people should, I mean, I don't think, you know, preference, I think the most qualified person should get the job, but you have to be able to develop those qualifications and stuff and be able to demonstrate them. And if you have a situation that is, is totally prejudiced against, you know, somebody that isn't super exceptional, um, then you need to make some adjustments to it. Um, you know, there's plenty of need for people with disabilities and, and, and doing stuff, but, I mean, in terms of advocacy and in terms of service organizations that directly impact people, you know, I think you have to use a judgment call there. I mean, for me to go into and, and try to organize in, in, in certain communities would be, be totally, you know, alien to, to being able to do that, and I think that's one reason being imposed from above kind of thing is one of the reasons that so many programs, good programs, have failed. And I also think it gets more into, you know, in terms of disability, you have a social work model that has been very oppressive and is very, you know, you're the client and I'm the professional, whereas as a legal empowerment model, um, you know, gives us power to do it. I mean, one of the worst things the right wing has done is take away the lawyers for people without money. And and thinking and talking about this area, um, I'm, you know, I'm approaching my 60s, so I'm a lifelong person with disability um, for some 58 years or so. And for a long, long time, I was told that that um, that I can't really determine my own destiny, my own life. And it was usually able-bodied people that always told me, "What's what is the best for me?" Mm-hmm. And I kind of wonder if Patrick or Ruth Ann or any um, or, or Doyle, if we kind of experience kind of the same things um, when we're doing um, work around uh, around disability work with, and, and you know, some people who do not have disabilities who and are p- position of responsibility that they have that same kind of attitude um, about knowing what's kind of best for us. Have you folks encountered this? This is Ruthanne. I certainly have. I've had able-bodied professionals at the Department of Rehabilitation tell me that because of my head injury, it was impossible that I would ever be able to, to go to graduate school. And all I think everyone who's had a disability, has, and I proved them probably false, everyone, I think, has a story of... I imagine, of some able-bodied person telling them that they couldn't do ABC and then they turned around and did it or that they were diagnosed med- medically that, you know, they weren't going to survive and they did. Or I'm sure everyone has a story along those lines. So, yeah, I, Eddie, you got it from the medical and the social community? Yeah, yeah. Or if, I mean, in school, I used to see it all the time. You know, but I'm talking too. Is that sort of that 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 um, mindset that we know better f- what's better, what's for, better you. for you? Yeah, I think sometimes I wonder if that comes up. You know, even people that that are serving other that are, that are serving people with disabilities. I wonder if it's there. You know, for me, one of the things that's most surprising to me about that sort of attitude is I run into it a lot with uh, progressive people who aren't disabled, and uh, there's a lot of uh, thinking in. Uh, You'll see it in progressive circles where they'll call somebody a uh, uh, crazy or a wacko or a wingnut or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have a, a mental disability. I'm a depressed person. So they're really basically attacking somebody for having a disability. And they never think about that. And when you try to bring things like this up, which is disability rights, uh, they're dumbfounded that that's not what they mean, that's not what they stand for, and they can't get it that uh, – that there's something there. And what I think is kind of nice about uh, KPFA, if I can throw in a little comment here, is they let us, they've, they've been receptive to us. We have supportive people here, and this progressive community gets it. And uh, that's how I, I see things on from my end. Well, one of the things I liked about going into a wheelchair or living in Berkeley was, um, you know, people yelled at me for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, I, and I think that's, you know, I mean, I, I remember in seventh grade being the principal coming in and apologizing to us and the parents because there wasn't a segregated school built yet. Um, and fortunately, I got to go to a regular, even though it was Sacramento and it was flat, you know, yeah. <laughs> not like there were hills. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, in terms of, you know, we have this whole effort with Olmstead, you know, even though um, I doubt if 
the governor is going to do anything with it. But, I mean, we, we have vendors and stuff for people with developmental disabilities who have not hired people with developmental disabilities who are successfully living in the community for the most part to, to participate that. Or, or in, uh, you know, the psychiatric disability community, people who have, uh, you know, been able to successfully, you know, do with disabilities and be able to get into the community and do things. I mean, these are the people that should be, you know, doing programs. And, I mean, this, I think, is the part of, in you know, the early CIL. You know, you look at old newsreels. You know, people were buzzing around doing things. It was like this new concept that people with disabilities were running something and doing it. And, and you no, know, it really galvanized the world. And, and I mean, it's really a shame to me that uh, we've compromised ourselves that way and not, not been able to take back charge of it. I mean, I'm sure like that galvanized the world <laughs> phrase you made there. Th- this is Eddie. Um, we're going to have get, get another call right now. Um, let me just kind of mention some of the kinds of groups that I think um, that I'm talking about and I, that, sh- that um, should be staffed with people with disabilities. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about the independent living centers, which are real, real key. But, you know, there's a number of national groups um, that have influence, it seems. And so the issue is there. Should they be hiring people with disabilities in top positions? Um, we have uh, assistive technology groups, media groups, education groups, mm-hmm. um, your protection advocacies in each state. And your, um, there's also a number of legal groups, which are real, real important. Um, blind groups, deaf groups, and mental health groups. So those are just ki- the kinds of organizations um, um, that, that, that's in mind when this question comes up. Now I think we have um, Tom in Berkeley. Tom, are you still around? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I see a legal roadblock to uh, this uh, issue. Uh, for instance, the ADA requires able-bodied people to make accommodations to the disabled, and the best example is uh, paratransit. Um, transit agencies are required to establish paratransit services, but if the transit agency does not employ disabled people, there's no one to uh, be on the uh, at the head of the paratransit services. How do we deal with this uh, roadblock in the ADA itself? I don't think it's a matter of the roadblock. I think it's a matter of political will that governments have been, you know, not following the law. We've had a recent case in Marin County where the county's, the, the new deal, what, from the Department of Labor, there was a program to hire people with disabilities that was uh, jointly administered by the county and the Department of Rehab, and they had illegal job descriptions. I mean, it's like nobody read the technical manual, one of the first ones, you know, job, uh, things you're not supposed to do in the technical manual from the Department of Justice. Um, you know, if you go and there's nobody in a wheelchair there, you can kind of tell out of a 100 employees, if no one is in a wheelchair, you know, you can kind of tell there might be something wrong or, or nobody has a visual disability or something that you, I mean, it's not that it's an exact thing, but if you don't see it, you know, you can kind of surmise that, that something's wrong. Um, you know, we have, uh, we've had basically a really gutless Department of Rehabilitation that has failed in government to enforce, you know, full employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, and, and, you know, the, as the government, state government has wimped out, the same people have continued from Wilson through Davis through, uh, what's his name now? Schwarzenegger. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. It's, he's such a weird person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was polite. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, he's a social moderate, and he's going to balance the budget killing off people. I mean, it, it you know, it, it, I don't know. How can you say anything then? Um, how about Sam and San Leandro? See, see what he says. Yeah, let's see. see what... Sam, are you there? Yes, hi. I'm just wondering, <clears throat> okay, my situation is that I've had depression for about 10 years now, really, really bad depression. I have not been able to hold a job. <laughs> Um, and I've just recently applied for Social Security uh, and, like, disability insurance. And, you know, the thing is, I'm really feeling like shit about it. <laughs> I'm just, like, really feeling like, you know, this this make me some kind of low life who's basically unfit to survive, you know, and, you know, I'm like, should I, should I seek euthanasia before I should go and seek, you know, like disability, social security insurance for depression, and I wonder if anybody can like speak to that. 
and I'll just go but, off the air. Okay. Um, Hello, just for our callers, uh, we, we'd like to uh, counsel you that because of, uh, of uh, the Bush administration, we, we have to be careful what we say on the air or they can uh, take KPFA off, KPFA off the air. So uh, please uh, uh, be careful. Um, you know, I think everybody that goes through a disability has those same feelings, no matter what the disability is. And I've never met anybody that went through a significant disability that didn't have periods. Um, you know, you really need to, to talk to, to somebody who's, you know, more than what we can do on the radio. But uh, this is yeah. Sam, This is why you, we need centers and organizations that are staffed by people who have been through, have had experiences like that, who have been through disability or have experienced depression and that can counsel people who have, I mean, they're not, you know, they maybe not be licensed psychiatrists or psychologists to be able to help out, but there can be a lot of peer support, which is why it's important to have these places staffed by people who have been down the road. And also role models. I mean, it's very important to see people who have been through it and be able Come to Come out the it. other side. Yeah. Well, isn't that one of the beauties that Ed Roberts was the director of Re Department of Rehab that long time ago? Mm -hmm. Right, the first person with a significant disability mm -hmm. to head a department, and uh, he he sure made a lot of those uh, old old guys because it's mostly guys then mm -hmm. uh, pretty do we, angry. Do we have a quick call from Jan? Do we have time? Uh, I think uh, we we uh, need to wrap up here. Okay, Jan, sorry we can't get we can't get to you. Uh, so we'd like to thank Patrick Connolly for joining us tonight. It was uh, good to have you here, and it's good to have your uh, insights on what our subject is for tonight. Uh, for, tonight. Uh, for Pushing Limits, I'm uh, Doyle Saylor, Eddie Ituarte, and Ruth Ann Spinner are on tonight with us. Uh, we'd like to ask you to stay tuned for Susan Stone and Act One. We want to thank our engineer, Erica Bridgman, the great work she did for us tonight. Our next show will be on February 20th at 6.30, 6.30 p.m., uh, and it'll be on Social Security. Thank you very much. Good night. Street, first and only never to repeated passion. Here the sum is equal to the total, singularity defeating multiplicity. The single swallow outdistances the flock. A single word brushes aside the entire poem. Here the tiny drop possesses greater power than the entire rainstorm. Purity and perfection built upon the single rock of the one night stand. Joe Frank, he's all yours.
Join him for the stories after dark, Sunday nights on KPFA. Joe Frank at 9 p.m. on Sundays, here at 94.1 FM.